<laughs> okay, so we're talking about solutions to Laplace's equation. We have we started to go well. We did go through an analytic approach, so it was quite a bit of work. And in fact, this is quite limited in terms of the systems it can solve. So to do more complicated, more interesting, more relevant conditions, we often turn to numerical approaches. Okay. And so today we're going to cover one such numerical approach known as finite difference. Have you guys heard of finite difference? Have you guys done finite difference? No? Okay. So, what are we trying to do? Well, remember the differential equation we have. Okay, so my heat equation. Um, okay, so that's the differential equation that we try to solve. And so now we want to solve this differential equation, not analytically but instead numerically. So in other words, what we want to do is approximate these derivatives. Okay? So when we solve it numerically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our continuous problem as posed here, and we're going to make it discrete. That is, we're going to solve the differential equation on a lattice. Okay? And then, what we're going to do with that lattice, we're going to approximate these derivatives and come up with a numerical scheme for obtaining the solution that we want. Okay? So, remember, we looked at these solutions. We're looking at the Laplacian, so we're looking at this in X and Y. So actually, this is the heat equation. But we're actually trying to solve this even easier. Okay. So this is what we want to find the numerical solution to. So we need an approach. Okay, and we solved this this morning when we had boundary like this, and remember we had the temperature set on all four sides. By the way, what kind of boundary conditions are those? The value of the temperature set each boundary, those are the Riesz-Lie boundary conditions. And the derivative of the temperature is set, what are those? Newman boundary conditions. Okay, these are good things to all right, so what we're going to do now is discretize it. So we're going to impose a grid. We basically want to come up with a way of solving u at some position x, y for each point on that grid. Okay? So when we solved it this morning, we have u x and y as continuous variables, now x and y will be discrete variables. We only look at them as these conditions. Is that okay with people? Okay. We need the value in between, we can always do some interpolation scheme. If we need an answer that's more precise, we can shrink the mesh size. Okay? All right. So, what do we do? Well, what we need to do is approximate these Derivatives. So let's consider evaluating some function phi, partial derivative with respect to x, at some location x equals i. And if we look at that on our grid, this is x at i, this is x at i minus 1, this is x at i plus 1. And the spacing here, let's call it delta. And that's just our grid spacing. OK? 
Anyone want to suggest the discrete version of this derivative? Excellent. Okay. What is the definition of a derivative? It's how function is changing in the local neighborhood, right? So let's calculate that. Let's figure out what it is here on the right hand side, figure out what it is on the left hand side. Just take the difference and divide it by twice the space. So this is the center difference definition. And we can also take forward difference where we look at this point minus this point divided by delta. So the backwards difference, this minus this divided by delta. This obviously has nice symmetry. Cool. Is this good with you guys? This really just comes from the definition of the derivative. Once we have our lattice. Yes. Any concerns? Okay, well, what we actually need is a second derivative. What's that going to be equal to? Okay, to define this with just these three points, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's calculate the derivative here and here with the forward difference method. And then take the derivative between of the derivative of those two derivatives. Okay? And so this derivative here is going to be xi plus 1 minus x of i over delta. This one's going to be x of i minus x of i minus 1 over delta. And then I want to know the difference between those. So I do minus here, and that's all over delta. Cool? Everybody okay with that? Yeah? Uh, oh, sorry. They should all be i. Thank you. People cool with that? Any concerns at this point? No? Okay, so again, this is just definition of derivative. And so this reduces to phi i plus 1 minus 2 phi i plus phi at i minus 1 over delta. Um, yes, you're right, delta squared. Approximation for our second order derivative. Now, in the notes, it shows you can get this exact same result just from the Taylor series expansion of the function. Okay? So leave it as an exercise to go through that and convince yourself you get the same thing. You can also estimate the error if you do it that way. Okay. So this result for We 
second order derivative our heat equation becomes phi at i plus 1j minus 2 phi i j plus phi i minus 1j that's all over delta squared and we add to that the same thing except now it's the j's changing not the i's That all is equal to zero. And from this, I can solve phi phi j equals one quarter by i plus one j okay, plus by i minus one j okay, plus by i j plus one plus by i j minus one. This is a very nice result. Why is this a very nice result? Anyone else think it's a nice result? I do. Remember, this whole thing is predicated on having a lattice here. Sarah, let's do a center line. So that I, this is. I, J. So I'm looking at this point. What do I know about that? Basically, it's average. Not basically, it's exactly the average of this nearest neighbor. To figure out this point, you do everything else. You wanted this point. All you have to do is add up this plus this plus this plus this and divide by four. That's what it's doing. Cool. So that gives us a very easy numerical scheme. Once we set up our grid, all we need to do is go through the points. Take this point, add up the neighbors, take the average. Find the average here, find the average here. Etc. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so if I'm actually going to do this, we need to talk about boundary conditions. Because I've shown how to solve this differential equation numerically with finite difference. We'll come back to the heat equation with time dependence in a, in a couple lectures. Okay, but for now we'll just do the Laplace. So that's how we solve that, but remember that's not a unique problem. To make the problem unique, we need to know our boundary conditions. Okay? 
And remember in the notes, we had the four bound conditions. We could set the temperature on each side, and then we had to do four separate analytic solutions and add them all up. So how do you think I can handle, those are all the recently boundary conditions, remember? How can I handle the recently boundary conditions in this numerics? And remember what the recently boundary conditions are. Basically, like having a block on each side here, and it's a question of what to do about the corners, but for each grid point here, you know, there'd be a corresponding grid point up here for each of these. And those temperatures are set, they're prescribed. And if all these outer points are at some prescribed temperature. So what do I do in my scheme as I'm going through and trying to figure out what U at each IJ here is? Well, notice now U becomes subscript IJ, not a function of Y. We only solve it at these discrete locations. Or you can write this as u x i y. Well, these temperature points at all these locations are set. So we don't need to loop over them to figure out what the temperature is there because it's prescribed. Okay, this is 100, and this is 20, this is 40, and this is 60. That's what they are. Don't need to look over them. Okay? So if we have to reach Lee, we simply don't loop over them because we already know what the potential is. And then we would start looping over at this point here. And then this point here would look, no, sorry, at this point here. And then this point here would look in the direction and see the reach Lee boundary condition here. See this reach Lee boundary condition here. And then see its non boundary condition papers as well. Cool? So if I have all being Dirichlet boundary conditions, I just loop over all the points inside of the grid, calculate this at each point, and I can get my solution. Oh, the geese are wild today. Eh? Uh, they're fighting. That's way more entertaining than this. Yeah, I really recommend you guys turn they just look like Okay, so, so we can go ahead and do that, okay? Now, another question arises, what are we gonna start with inside of here? Because we don't have any initial condition, right? We're looking for, we're trying to solve the Laplace, which is a long time steady state. What do we do with all of these grid points in here? What do we set them equal to? We know the boundary values, those are given. But what do we do with those interior points? What are we going to set them to? The answer is pretty much anything you want. Because what we're looking for is a steady state solution. So we can start with any temperature distribution in there that we want. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply this. We're going to loop through, calculate this. Our solution is going to change because we start with some initial condition, which is not the steady state solution, unless you're very good at guessing the steady state solution. Your solution is going to change. Go through it again. Calculate it again. Your solution is going to change. Go through it again. Calculate it again. And eventually what's going to happen is that the differences between your current solution and your previous solution then you get very small. In other words, for any initial temperature distribution, this will converge to the steady state solution, which is what we're after. So the initial temperature distribution doesn't matter. Some initial temperature distributions will get you to the steady state solution faster than others, okay? But it doesn't actually matter what we do with initial condition. Cool? Everybody cool with this? Very simple algorithm. 
you just loop through the sites that are not boundary conditions, calculate the average of the neighbors, that's the new value. You keep doing that, looping through, looping over all of them, until your difference is very small, such that you know you've converged to the steady state solution. And that is it for finding difference. Good. It's very straightforward numerical algorithm, but it's also very, very powerful. All right. This, everything we've talked about, like we do in this course always, is for Dirichlet boundary conditions, but those are not our only type of boundary conditions. We also have the Newman boundary conditions. For those, we have to be a little bit more careful. So Dirichlet was easy because we know the value of you there, so we can just skip it in our sum because we already know what it's equal to, right? No problem. But how about when I have the following condition? Let's take a point here and let's set i equal to zero. Okay, in other words, x is equal to zero here. This is i is equal to 1. And what I know, my boundary condition here, is that d phi dx, uh, let's say x equals 0, is negative g x. That cannot be a function of x. This is called negative. So this is a Newman boundary condition where we don't know the value of a function, but we know the value of the derivative of a function. What is our po most popular Newman condition case? What do we like to equal to? What does that correspond to? Physically insulated. Insulated. Okay? It's just like we have an insulated end, there can be no heat flow into or out of there which means the derivative of the temperature with respect to that spatial dimension must be zero. Because if there isn't, we would have it. Okay? So I'm looking at this point, and I want to average my neighbors. Okay? I can look up and down, no problem. I can look to the right, but I can't look to the left, I'm on the edge. All right? We didn't have this before with the reasoning. Because we just we don't loop over those points, right? But we always would have something on the left if it was a direction. Cool. Not only that, we need, we want whatever we're going to do to satisfy this boundary condition. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're consider a fictitious point out here that i equals negative one. And then this derivative with respect to x, if x equals zero, and write as phi ij, or sorry, phi 1j, not ij, minus phi negative 1j over to delta. So with this fictitious point, I can consider the derivative from here to here, and then the total gap between the two is two delta. Good? Also know this is equal to negative j. means we can solve phi at negative 1j is equal to phi at 1j plus 2 delta
good. So we make a fictitious point. The boundary condition allows us to describe a value to that fictitious point. And then here's the point of that. We can bring that into this equation here. And we just substitute the i minus 1, okay, for that case. So this is specific for, it's not just for any ij anymore. It would be for a human condition at x equals 0. And if you substitute that in, do a little bit of algebra, like this. Okay, if we have the insulated case, this reduces because g is equal to zero for the insulated case. Notice that the insulated case is also relevant for when you're solving electric potentials. Okay. So what ends, ends up happening if you have an insulated boundary condition, so let's say this boundary here is not the region Okay, but this was some kind of insulator. You're at this point here. You look above, you look below, and twice to the right. And you take the average of those. All right, so not only is the central algorithm very easy, boundary conditions are also very easy. So recently you simply don't loop over. And Newman, if it's insulating, you just look twice in the other, you ignore the insulated direction and look twice in the other direction. That's it. Okay, so notice with this corner point here, you look in these two directions twice for both of them. It's insulating above and below. Let's say we had insulating below. Any questions on this? So let's look at some actual code. And so I'm going to draw a sketch here. What we're going to do. So first do the racially boundary conditions. And I'm going to set L equals 20 and H equals to 20. And I'm just going to have a grid spacing of 1, just to make the code as clean as possible. Okay, you can change the grid spacing, no problem. I'm going to set the temperatures. So it's going to be 0 at along x equals 0. It's going to be 100 along x equals L. It's going to be 60 along y equals 60 going to be 20 along y equals h. Cool. So that sets the value. 
along all of these points here. So x equals zero, x equals L. This line here is oh I have the backwards. Y equals zero, and so this would be Y equals H. Okay? All of these grid points here are now prescribed. Cool. So I'm going to loop through. I'm going to make an empty two-dimensional array view. I'm going to fill it with zeros. Then I'm going to loop along x equals zero, and for y in the range of zero to h, I'm going to set that equal to x. So I'm setting the value of the two-dimensional array, which represents our temperature on the grid. Well, on that line, I'm just going to go in and fill it equal to x. Everybody good with that? Okay, so all I'm doing is going along this line and saying, okay, this is equal to, what is it equal to? It's not equal to zero, okay? The temperature is zero here, zero here, zero here, zero here. Okay, those are boundary conditions. And then do the same thing for x equals L. And in the case of x equals L, it's 100. So I'm going to fill in 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. Good. Those are all boundary value points. Not going to change. Cool. I then just do the same thing in y. y equals 0 and y equals h. Okay, so all of these points here, boundary value. Good. The rest of the array is set equal to zero. Because so I filled the entire array of state. So I'm taking my initial condition to be a temperature of zero everywhere except for the boundaries. Cool. What do I want to do next? What should happen next in the code? What do we do now? All of these are set. All the interior points are zero. Are we done? Feel that that's our solution? What do we do? Start averaging? Yeah. Um, and where am I going to start averaging? Well, let's just say start here. Okay. And so this point is currently zero. I'm going to look at this temperature, add it to this, add it to this, which is going to be zero, add it to this, which is going to be zero. Take the average. Is the temperature of this point going to be zero anymore? Nope. Not zero. And then I go to this point. Okay. Now there's a question here. When I go to this point, I'm going to average here, here, and here, and also here. Do I take the value when this is equal to zero, or do I take the updated value? What did you do? Pardon me? What did you do to zero? Yes. Sometimes. So you, you're absolutely right. We would take the value when it's equal to zero. If we are doing the time series solution to this. Okay. Remember, what we're doing right now is not actually evolving the solution in time. What we're doing right now is just, just trying to find a steady state solution. We're just looking for the solution that this is converting to. Okay. We will come back to the question of time in a couple lectures, and then you're absolutely right. But since we're just looking for the solution, you actually get faster convergence using updated. Are we doing this just for the sake of filling everything up? Like well, filling everything up with the correct number. Yes. Okay. So I 
haven't talked about time at all in the derivation of finite difference like So we're not proposing at this time that this is the um, word that we're following the solution along the correct path in time. Okay? We'll come back to that and see if we aren't far off from doing that. But for now, we're just looking for what the steady state solution is because we're only solving the pi, not the equation. Cool. So it's actually a little bit faster to get convergence if you use the updated value. Because you don't have to wait for the next time step for that heat to propagate from the edge. Okay? Good. Is it your answer that like on the values that it changed depending on? Not the steady state solution. And when you've reached convergence within some tolerance, then, then that's that. That's what that is. The errors will matter on which corner you start from and all of that. But we're just trying to get to the steady state solution. By definition, that should be changing. So no matter how you get there, as long as that's the solution that satisfies that different equation, those boundary conditions, it's not changing. That's the solution. Good. Good-ish. Okay, because you can also do other things to speed up your calculation. What you can do is um, you can look at the difference between the point what the current value is and what the value you're proposing is, and you can actually increase that difference by some multiplier. So that you over relax the system. So that you go to you get convergence even faster, as long as it doesn't blow up. Okay? Because again, all you're trying to do is get to the steady state solution. Cool. Let's pretend that's cool for now. All right. So, because it makes my code easier. Don't worry about this stuff, this is graphing stuff, okay? But here, n, so n here is the number of iterations that I'm gonna go through the loop, okay? I'm gonna do it 100 times, okay? We're not gonna do any particular check for convergence right now. What you would do is you would look at the maximum deviation between, uh, one any point in its previous value, and when that falls below some threshold, you would say you've obtained convergence. Okay? So you would have a tolerance. For now, let's just run it and see what happens. So I'm going to do that for 100 iterations. I'm going to loop over my x, which is just going to go from 1 to L, because I have a delta of 1. And then, of course, I also have to loop over y. And then my y at x, y is just going to be the Average of the neighbor of the points, or the average of the neighbor of the points. Okay? We're just doing duration here, and we'll come to good. So notice the bounds on these loops. They start at one, and they don't go all the way to L because in Python the upper limit is not inclusive. So this actually goes to L minus one, which is good because those are where our boundary. Goes. Cool? Everybody on board with it. Okay? So once we do all of those loops, we would have our solution after that iteration. Okay? Any questions on that? So this is a very, very straightforward algorithm. And okay, this is a tiny implementation. Okay? And it can actually do really cool stuff. All right, are we good? We're all good with this? Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so I have my different boundary conditions. This is my zero, temperature zero. This is temperature 100, this is 20, and this is my 60. Okay, and everything started low at a temperature of zero, except for the boundaries, and then started increasing. And you can see here by 100, the solution has stopped changing very much. Okay, so we have some decent convergence. 
Good. So this is the exact solution that we found in class today. We did it for one non-homogeneous boundary condition. And then we would have to add up the solution for the other three. Okay? So it's a complicated analytic solution. It's three lines of code. Okay, and it gives you very nice results. And I thought like the sweep, you can rotate this thing around and see that you end up with a complex potential landscape. Okay, a complex heat distribution. Good. Everybody good? Let's look at that again. And now we can start with the different initial temperature distribution. Okay, we can fill this with 200 instead. See what happens. Okay, so very hot in the system. And then the walls are at various temperatures. And we can see how this approaches the steady state solution. Now this isn't the Time evolution was not far from. Okay, and we'll see we only have a few minor changes, such as Eric said, we should be using all the values on the grid at the same point. Instantaneously update of this iterable point. Okay. We're very close to having the time evolution. Good? Is this good with everybody? Any questions on this? Okay. So what's the big deal? We managed to solve this analytically in class this morning. Right? Why are we worrying about code? Just because I like to code, right? Rather than this. Well, before we answer that question, let's do one more case. Let's do a case where I have a Newman boundary condition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have I'm going to set the temperature along x equals 0 and x equals L, like we have already. Okay. Uh, no, I want to... But in the y direction, I want to have two insulating walls. It looks like... Guys still red. And then in Y, these guys are Newman boundary conditions. So now what is my program going to look like? Okay, initially it looks the same in the beginning except I'm only doing the initial, so I spill the whole thing with zeros, and then I initialize along x equals zero and x equals L, because those are my racially boundary conditions. And so now when I do my loop, previously I started at this point. Where do I start now? Okay, pardon me? Somewhere else is one option. The other option is the same place. So we have one vote for somewhere else. Does anyone want to be more specific about where else? These are Newman boundary conditions, which means we have to move over them. Okay? So this would be the first point I start at if I go from 0 to L. From this point, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to look here, which is going to be a nice initially boundary condition. I'm going to look here, which is going to be the value of the function is going to be zero initially, and twice here, which is also zero. Okay? And then once I get in here, I can do it like, because I have four good 
Good with everybody? Yes? So what that means is my loops, n is again my number, my index with the iteration. x is going to go from 1 to L because x equals 0 and x equals L, the temperature is set. But my y is going to go from 0 to h plus 1. Good. And if y is equal to 0, what I do, I look to the left and right because x is y, but I can only look up in y, and so I multiply that value by 2. Okay? If it wasn't insulating, but the rate at which heat was leaving was control, controlled, we would just have that factor of change as well. Okay? If y isn't equal to 0, then it's also possible it equals h. And if it's equal to h, I look again to the left and the right, but now I can only look down because I'm at the top of the system. And I multiply that value by 2. And if y doesn't equal 0 and y doesn't equal h, then I have one of my normal points. And I look to the left and right and the Good? It's okay with everybody. So again, it's very straightforward. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, it doesn't quite converge. If I rotate it, you can see there's still a slope here. Okay, what do you think that should converge to? Just a straight line. What is this system? This is the system we've been setting the whole class. Remember, we talked about a rod in X with open ends, but in every other direction it was insulated. So we had essentially a one-dimensional system. That's what we're getting here. There's no dependence to the solution in the y direction. Good. So this numerical algorithm at least agrees with our intuition and also what we based what we're doing in this course so far. So that's any questions on this? Everybody's good with this? Okay. Then, let's do one last example here. And to demonstrate how useful finite difference is, I'm going to take a system that can't be solved in a I mean, it can, you can use approximations and so on, okay? but not exactly. And we'll see that it's quite easy in the finite difference approach. What we're going to do is take an L shape. So again, we're going to have our grid that so will look like that. Okay? And we're going to set some W value. My different colors. So all the points here, we're going to say these are human boundary conditions. We have an insulator to the left. Okay? And also along here. And then what I want to do is I want to take a certain number of points here where I'm going to set the temperature to be some value. Okay? And I want to do the same thing down here. And then for points here, I also want it to be in its All point. Okay. 
Cool? What I have, basically, the problem I want to solve. Let's say this is a temperature of zero. We start with everything at a temperature of zero and a non zero temperature here. I want to see how heat flows around the corner. Okay? It's actually a very industry relevant problem. Okay? How do you achieve good heat flows in complicated geometries? Cool. So what's my code going to look like for this? Well, if I were to start my loop here, what we should really start doing is considering special cases. And we have a number of them. So I do the usual here, create an array, fill it with zeros, and to define some w value, Okay, which basically just gives me the number of points here. Okay, to define that geometry. I'm again going to loop over a certain number of iterations. And the way I've gone about coding this is I'm going to consider special case. So I start by saying special equals zero. And then I look if I'm in a special case. If I'm in a special case, I do something funky. If I don't, if I'm not in a special case, I can do my usual of just averaging all my Good. So that's the approach we're going to take to programming this up. What are my special cases? Pardon me? It gets even more complicated. So let's just start from here. Is this a special case? Yeah, I don't have neighbors here or here, but definitely can't average my form here. Right? So this is defined to be next to an insulator. What is this point going to be? Next to insulator in both X and Y. Nope. Nor did not. <laughs> so it's next to an insulator in two directions. Yeah. So we set up, we just go over to, like we did with the other insulated case. What do you mean over to? Uh, like, instead of just going over one print space, we over to two. Well, that's how we used to derive it, but we came up with a really simple algorithm. So let's actually move to this point here. How do I calculate this one? So I add up this plus this plus two times this. two times this. Yeah. So what am I going to do here? Get two times whatever's on the right, two times whatever's on the top. Yes. Two times this plus two times this divided by a quarter. Okay. So x equals zero and y equals zero. Take two times to the right, two times up. Cool. And if that's the case, flag, we have a special case we've already taken care of. So that we don't do the generic case. Okay? Is this point a special case? Yes, we just talked about it. Okay? So if x equals zero and we haven't done a special case, that means y wasn't zero. Right? And so what we what that means is we can then do two to the right. So the case I'm actually looking at is this point here. So I can do two to the right and up and down. Cool. And I can do the exact same thing for the y equals zero case, but x doesn't equal zero. 
but can be left and right and twice up. Good. How are we done with our special cases? Okay, so look, we've gone through all of these. These are all done, right? We can loop back here. Oh, this point here should be uh, fixed. Okay, we can loop back here, taking care of this point. When we get here, we have our first non special. Okay, and so we go in here. Okay, are there any more special points in our system? So notice that our loop is only going up to this line and this. Don't have to worry about these points here because they are fixed. Good. Okay, so we Good. Taking care of these special points and these special points. Anything else? <coughs> Yeah, so these guys here, right? These guys here, we're actually not so worried about. Okay? We'll see that we can actually kind of ignore them. Okay? Because they only depend on their neighbors, right? And so, what are we going to do here? How about a point like this guy? Well, I can look in this direction fine, this direction fine, this direction fine, but this whole block here I'm considering to be in its length. Okay? So when x equals w, I can't look to the right. I can look up and down, but I can't look to the right. I need to look twice to the left. So when x equals w, and y is greater than w. Okay, so when x equals w and y is greater than w, I look twice to the left. And up, up, and down. Good? Is that cool, people? And when I'm over here, I have the same situation. I can look left and right, can't look up, so I look twice down. So when y equals w and x is greater than w, means you're somewhere in this quadrant here. Well, no, you're along this line here. If you said when y equals w, I look twice down. Good? Okay. And if y is greater than w, and x is greater than w, right, it's a special point. So if we just say special equals 1, not actually do anything about it, those points will just stay at the right side. Good? Everybody okay with this algorithm? It's what we just saw for the recently new game human boundary conditions before. And then now we have to be careful as we march through the grids to do the appropriate calculation at each point. Okay? Notice that interesting, this is not a special point here. Because I can look up, and look to the right, and of course left and down. Good? Any questions on this? So then this is a very simple algorithm. In its form, in its boundary conditions, and to implement. So I just keep doing this over and over again, and let's see what it looks like. Oops. 
this, kind of how heat would flow around my body. Good. Okay, so we start at 100 degrees here, and it's going down to 10 degrees here, okay? And so you can see that it's actually hottest around this outside edge. It's a little cooler on this inside edge here. Okay, we lose heat more coming down here. And so this is what your solution looks like. Any questions? So this is a relatively complicated solution. Can't do this analytically. It's very easy to program. So this is the power of algorithms like finite difference, and there's a closely related algorithm which is more complicated, but similar in spirit, finite algorithm. Okay, and these are heavily used in research and industry to solve problems. Okay, you can even do cool things like model a car as a finite element and put in all the material properties and then model how it will what will happen if it hits a telephone pole. Okay. Big areas is heavily used in industry. Questions. And heat flow is actually a big thing too. I know a couple of people I used to work with in the lab now do this. Professionally Any questions, concerns, comments? Want to see this again? Because it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Anyone else think it's awesome? Okay, very simple code. It gives very nice results. Okay. I think he doesn't think it's awesome. It's all It's all right. I should turn the lights back on. It's Monday, it's been a long week. Any other questions? Or any questions at all or comments or concerns? Yeah. Can we get the yeah. Um I'm not sure yet. So definitely on an assignment, you know, after the midterm, I want you guys to do some fun activity stuff. And so I have to think about exactly how much code I'm gonna give you. Because if I just give it to you all, then I want you to work with it. So, um, but the ideas are very simple. You're just averaging your neighbors. All you have, all I ever have to do is look up for special cases. Okay. If one of your points is Dirichlet. Okay. Well, Dirichlet points are super easy. You just never loop over them because they never change. Okay. And if one of your neighbors is Dirichlet, that's great. You always know what its value is. And if it's a Newman boundary condition, it just means you can't look in that direction. You just look twice in the other direction. And that's it. I will definitely give you the code for doing the plotting because it's pretty awesome. Right? You can't rotate it while it's updating it, but then when it finishes, you can rotate it. This is pretty sweet. All right. Comments, concerns, questions? Find a difference? It's great. Are all good with this? Uh, we're going to start the next topic. We have 15 minutes and we're behind. I know, right? We're behind it. The problem is they cut the semester shorter. So, got to keep on a very rigid path here. Okay. So, we have been talking about thus far. The heat equation. And we looked at the Laplacian, but that's just the steady state of the heat equation in a certain number of dimensions. So we're learning all these techniques, but we're really only looking at 
one differential equation. Okay, so to kind of combat that, we're going to look at a very similar but slightly different differential equation and see that the same techniques can apply there. Of course, it'll be slightly different. Okay, and so this will be the heat equation. It will be the wave equation. Okay, and we know how the heat equation or diffusion equation and the wave equation differ. Anyone know the wave equation? So, what do you expect physically to be the difference between the solutions to the heat equation and the wave equation? Anything? Or should they be the same? Yep. Right, so what do we see for the time part of the heat equation? Yeah, exponential k. Do we expect that for the wave equation? No, we expect oscillations. Okay. We're not going to have a first order time derivative of our function. We're going to have a second order time derivative of our function. It'll give us nice oscillations. Good? Okay. So let's go through another torturous derivation of the differential equation. And to do that, let's consider a string. Okay? Consider a guitar string. A guitar string, you have the nut there, the bridge here, and you pluck the guitar string. What happens? Well, going to oscillate. It has different modes, right? That's the fundamental mode, right? That's the note, the lowest frequency oscillation. But different overtones can fit into this, right? This also fits in there. Because, of course, what we have here is an eigenvalue problem. Certain wavelengths can fit in. Okay, so this is the first over. The second harmonic. Good. And then we can keep doing this. All right. And you guys know why does an A on a guitar sound different than an A on a flute? Why does an A on a flute sound different than an A on a bowl? Anyone know? They're all playing A, why do they sound different? No. They're the same frequency, but the speed of the shape is But the shape is different. Frequency is the same, but the wave is different. Nope. Bring in the wavelength there. Just inverse the channel. What do you mean the shape is different? Like, if you look at that, let's say, um, basically, let's say you have uh, 400 volt megahertz. That, that just means that it, it oscillates. The same pattern oscillates. Just 440, 440 hertz. Of, yeah, 440 megahertz of like. Not even dogs are going to hear it. <laughs> yeah, 440 hertz. That just means that it's, it oscillates 440 times per second, yep. which means it cycles 440 times in one second. Yep. But it doesn't mean that the way it, the pattern repeats, it doesn't mean it's the same. Wait, so, depending on what the pattern is. So, how are you getting same. different um, waveforms? Because this is all just resonance, right? This is just air vibrating, just string vibrating back and forth. Like, are you making a guitar that somehow produces triangle oscillations? It's going to be hard. Yeah? What do you mean, how it was made? So, under the tree, you've got a different voltage. 
curved than the engineering people in the language is straight? Uh, so that actually gets complicated, but it's not necessarily so. Maybe a little bit. That is a very interesting. Thing. <laughs> very interesting. Any other ideas? So that comes into it. A lot of things come into it. It fundamentally boils down to this. Okay? We have an eigenvalue problem. Okay? If you blow into a loop inducing driving frequencies at some frequency, sorry, driving pressure waves at some frequency, if it's in resonance with whatever you're holding the keys on the loop, it's going to give a certain effective length to the pipe, and you achieve resonance with that. Okay? Only certain frequencies of the air moving back and forth will give you resonance, will give you the frequency. Okay. In other words, if you plug a guitar, this vibration of the string going up and down, just like that, is the note. Okay, that's A. But I can also have this contribute. And that's a harmonic. That's not A. That might be D. Okay. And a certain amount of this eigenvalue is mixed in with the A. So the string is not just going up and down. There's this mixed into it. And then there's the next harmonic, which is mixed into it, which is that. Okay. The character of the instrument is more about these harmonics, which ones are present and in how much. Okay, so a sweet assignment that I had cut in the course was where you did a Fourier transform of a note played by a clarinet. And you can have open and closed and wind instruments. Okay, and one of them only gives you odd harmonics and the other one only gives you, well, gives you both harmonics. And the character of the sound is very different because of the open versus closed. Because you get different harmonics. Okay? What if for harmonics, every instrument would sound like a tuning fork? So the tuning fork is about as pure of just a fundamental frequency you can get. Alright? So it's all this other stuff mixed in that gives you really good character of the instrument. So we're in different instruments through a spectrograph. So you can get the Fourier transform and you can come up with the look at the character of the instrument and looking at the Fourier transform. Cool? Yeah? Alright. Anyway, we don't care about any of that. We're gonna pluck a string and we're gonna just look at the we want to derive a wave equation for this. And so we're going to take a string and we're going to consider it between the points x and x plus delta x. So we're going to consider this short element of string. And we're going to try and do forced balance on this so that we can use f equals ma. We can come up with some differential equation. So if I do that, what, what forces do I have in my system? Anybody? I pluck a string. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking at some segment of the string here. Okay? This is the blow up of that. What forces do I have in my system? Anything? Yeah. yeah. How does tension act? Yeah, so it's like it's tangential to the line described by the string of it. Right? 
So we would have tension here. So T, capital T, at X at some time. And we would also have a tension over here. Anything else? I want to ask the question, what forces we have in the system? What can you almost always answer? And it's true. It may be negligible, but it's true. Gravity. Okay. What? What do you say? Normal. Normal. No, no, no. We're not always standing on something, right? We like to have a lot of free floating things like this. Okay. So we can also have force gravity. Okay, so let's also describe the tangent to the string with respect to the horizontal. Okay, and let's call that angle theta. But look at the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction. What must this be equal to? Yeah. Okay. The string is only vibrating up and down. You're not considering the thing stretching such that things are moving back and forth like this as they vibrate. Only up and down. Okay, so what that means is using this geometry here, I have negative Txt because it points towards the left cosine theta xt <coughs> plus Tx plus delta x t uh, cosine x plus delta x. And that must equal zero. Okay, so for simplicity, let's define a variable h which is equal to either one of those terms. Okay, what do I have in the vertical direction? We have the same thing except with signs, right? Of gravity in the vertical direction. And this is equal to MA. Okay? When we're looking at the string case, our what we're calculating is the displacement of the string at any position at any time. The so UX of T is now the displacement of the string. And so our acceleration is simply the second derivative of that with respect to time. Good? Acceleration by definition is the second derivative of distance. Position. Yes? Okay. We'll come back on Thursday and we'll finish this derivation. And then we'll look at Solutions. Pardon me?
Yeah. Oh yeah, no. So not till next Monday. We'll totally forget what we just said. Right. Midterm. <laughs> hey, I will gladly forget about it. We know what that means. Those are your final. <laughs> Hmm? Never mind. No, it's not a good idea, generally. Exactly. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so.